Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's interactive dialogue webinar. Um, for those who have, this is their first time participating in one of uh, these interactive dialogues, the idea is to be interactive with the audience, so please feel free to include questions to the presenters as they're going. There's a chat screen on the left-hand side of your window in the webinar view, and you can um, send in questions, and we'll try to answer them as we go so that it's not just a, a, you know, a presentation being marched through and hopefully we can have some um, discussion as we go forward. <clears throat> the discussion today is going to be on a copyright update, monkeys music, and much, much more. Um, you'll be hearing from me, although very sparingly. My name is Gina Cornelio. I'm a partner in the Denver office at Dorsey, uh, specializing in patent prosecution. And the, the real experts today are Mike Keyes. He's a partner in the Seattle office and specializes in intellectual property litigation and has vast experience in cases involving trademarks, copyrights, false advertising, including individual consumer and class action claims. And then um, Chris Leffer, who is also a partner in our Seattle office and has both worked uh, as outside and in-house counsel and so can bring a unique client-centric perspective. And with um, nearly two decades of experience in over 100 intellectual property cases, including all um, facets of IP. And uh, today's, like I said, please feel free um, to go ahead and ask questions as we go, and we'll try to address them in real time. And Mike and Chris have both promised to be informative, hilarious, and um, all things you could desire from a webinar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Mike and Chris. That's, that's a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Keyes. I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. We've got a lot of fun cases that we're going to be uh, discussing with you this morning. So uh, I think we'll kick off this morning's discussion with one of my favorite cases that's been decided uh, recently, which is Naruto v. Slater. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this case. Um, if you see here on the screen, uh, that uh, handsome primate there on the left, that is Naruto, the plaintiff. Uh, and on the right is a photographer, David Slater. So for those of you that may not be familiar with the Naruto saga, uh, Naruto is a seven-year-old, or was a seven-year-old um, at the time of the, the case filing, a crested macaque, uh, which as near as I can tell means he's um, um, a monkey. Uh, he lives in Indonesia in a uh, habitat uh, preserve, a wildlife reserve. And David Slater, our defendant, is a photographer from the UK that visited the habitat and placed his camera down on a rock and Naruto snatched it up and started taking all sorts of pictures of himself, uh, hence the monkey selfie case. Um, uh, Slater returns to the UK, publishes an anthology of these cute little monkey selfies. PETA hears uh, about the publication of this and decides to bring a case on behalf of Naruto as Naruto's next friend, and files a case for copyright infringement in the Northern District of California. Uh, the case proceeds, uh, and both sides are, are, are lawyered up, and the district court ultimately dismisses the case, saying that there is no standing for Naruto to bring a claim of copyright infringement. Uh, ultimately, that case is appealed to the Ninth Circuit, by Naruto and his lawyers, there were some, uh, some procedural uh, machinations below. There was ultimately a settlement uh, with respect to some of the parties at issue. But in any event, the, the appeal does proceed to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit decides to address two issues. Um, one was whether PETA had standing to bring this copyright claim for Naruto. And ultimately, it found that, no, PETA does not. It does not have uh, a special relationship with Naruto that would entitle it to step into Naruto's shoes and bring this case on its own. But the court didn't stop there. The court said this is non-jurisdictional, ultimately, PETA's standing. So we need to address whether Naruto uh, himself has standing. 
uh, and the court said, actually, Naruto has constitutional standing to bring this case, but ultimately does not have standing under the Copyright Act because the Copyright Act does not in, in, envision a monkey bringing a claim for copyright infringement. Um, interestingly enough, there's a concurring opinion by Judge Smith that said, look, this whole thing is bananas. We, we shouldn't have entertained this case at all. Uh, the district court's decision should be vacated. Federal courts don't have jurisdiction to entertain such a, uh, uh, such a claim at all. Um, that, that was, we thought, going to be the end of it, but then the case took a bit of a turn after the opinion came out. Uh, one of the judges there at the Ninth Circuit requested sua sponte that the, the entire court hear the case. Um, but it's just not meant to be. Uh, last month, uh, the full Ninth Circuit uh, denied uh, hearing the case on box. So I guess the circus is, has finally left town, at least for now. We're not going to uh, have any further Naruto sightings, at least in federal court. The case uh, was good for, I think, a lot of laughs, including uh, some memes uh, that made their way uh, around various uh, social media platforms. This happens to be uh, one of my favorites. So, uh, but I guess that's all we're going to hear about Naruto for now. Mike, we have a we, we have move? a question quick oh, um, okay. before we move uh, before we move on, which is sure. if he had constitutional standing, how is that not enough to state a claim for under the Copyright Act? <clears throat> Uh, so you would need to satisfy two components of standing. Uh, constitutional standing, I think, is what we just generally refer to as Article Three standing, uh, which gives you the right to be in federal court. But then, of course, you need to also go to the next level, which is, okay, you're, you have standing to pursue a claim in federal court. Do you have a claim under the substantive statute that's at issue? And the court looked at that and said, no, look, it just doesn't – you know, we, we, can't, we can't divine any intent in the language or otherwise from the statute that Congress intended uh, monkeys to have standing. They look particularly at the issues related to um, uh, copyright in, uh, succession uh, of, of, uh, of when copyright is transferred intergenerationally and just said it wouldn't make sense. I mean, I could, I could conjure up, I think, a number of different ways why it doesn't make sense. For example, you know, how's, how is Neruda going to certify his copyright application? You know, how are we going to tell if he selects between um, uh, statutory damages and actual damages? I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of different uh, problems associated with um, uh, Naruto having standing. So I think the court made the right decision. Good question. Yeah, that, um, I guess kind of uh, – Related to that is, do you see this case opening the door to any future, you know, AI and other smart devices that can kind of ca automatically capture um, photographic images um, in terms of asserting copyrighted, you know, over those uh, images? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that that is um, an issue that is going to come to the fore here before too long. I don't think that this case necessarily um, implicates the issue one way or another, because ultimately the court said there's, there's not standing. I mean, it was just related to this specific litigant, i.e. Naruto, uh, and the next friend that, was, that brought it, uh, the case, PETA. So I, I would imagine that in an AI context, we probably have quite a bit, uh, a different set of facts to, to deal with. Great. Why don't we move on to another interesting case, uh, involving Disney and Redbox. So Disney, as, as you all uh, are aware, distributes its animated movies and other content on DVDs, Blu-rays, and does so in what are called combo packs or combination packs. And these combo packs allow a user that has purchased the the uh, DVD or the Blu-ray in question, um, what's included with that purchase is a code. And you can take that code and go to uh, what's called moviesanywhere.com or disneymoviesanywhere.com. You can use that code, input the code, and download the film that you just purchased. For example, here in the slide we have Aladdin. 
So you see, if you purchase the Aladdin combo pack, not only would you get it with respect to the DVD, but you could then go to the website, take that code, and, and input the code, and uh, download the film. The catch would be is that you would have to agree to Disney's uh, terms of service. And the relevant ones for purposes of our discussion today are that you would have to acknowledge as a user that Disney owns the digital code and that the user uh, represents that he or she owns the physical product that accompanied the code at the time of purchase. So that's essentially how combo packs worked or how they used to work uh, at the outset of the case. So, uh, oh yes, I should also mention that here's a, uh, on the back of the Aladdin DVD, uh, it does have some small printed language that the codes are not for sale or transfer and that terms and conditions apply. And of course, those terms and conditions that are apply are the terms of service that one would encounter when you input the code on DisneyMoviesAnywhere.com and that you'd have to agree to those other terms that I'd, I'd mentioned previously. So, of course, Redbox is in the business. It has about 15,000 kiosks throughout the country at various grocery stores and mall outlets and, and what have you, and it distributes movies uh, for rental. What it started doing, because it doesn't have a relationship, any sort of formalized business relationship with Disney, is Redbox purchased a number of combo packs at retail. And then Redbox would remove the piece of paper with the code, that little digital code we talked about. Redbox would then repackage that code and sell that separately to consumers that would come to the Redbox to purchase films or otherwise rent them. So Disney was not happy about that, as you can imagine, and sued for, there was actually a couple of claims initially. There was a breach of contract claim and also a contributory copyright infringement claim. Uh, and they moved for an injunction with respect to the copyright claim. Um, so interestingly enough, the court looked at this and said, look, what, what essentially this model looks like to me at the preliminary injunction stage is, you are you provided this code to the consumer uh, that has purchased it with the understanding that they will be able to download that movie or otherwise go and stream it online. But you don't tell them at the time of their purchase that it's going to be subject to a number of restrictions. So essentially what you're doing is, again, this was all at the preliminary injunction stage, what you're doing is you're essentially thwarting Section 109, which is the, the first sale doctrine, which you're essentially restricting what an end user can do with that physical good once he or she has purchased it. So ultimately, the court said, you're not likely to prevail on the merits based on the record that's before me. Uh, so that injunction was denied. Well, Disney amended its complaint to allege a rather new set of facts um, that it, it has significantly modified not only the packaging with respect to the DVDs and Blu-rays, but it had also modified the website terms of service. So now on the modified packaging that was presented to the court at the next preliminary injunction phase, uh, you now have the, the digital code uh, and you have this language here that fully discloses uh, that it's going to require um, prior acceptance of license terms and conditions and, and alerts the consumer to the fact that the codes are only for their personal use by the recipient of this combination pack or a family member. Also, when consumers would go to uh, DisneyMoviesAnywhere.com, they were alerted to the, the licensing nature of this particular uh, code, that this was just being provided for redemption by the individual uh, that obtains the code, the original code from the uh, original purchase, and you see the language here. So ultimately what the court said is under this set of facts, now what you've done is actually created an, an enforceable license uh, that, that wasn't enforceable before because at the time of purchase, Consumers didn't know what the terms of the license were going to be, didn't know that they were going to have to give up their Section 109 rights, 
and now you've you've alerted them to that. And it was important for the court's consideration that if if consumers wouldn't agree to these terms, they could get a full refund. So uh, ultimately entered a, a limited injunction with respect to uh, Redbox's uh, conduct with respect to these new uh, these new products that are at issue. Hey, Mike, we have a question. Did, yes. the, did the court in the Disney case find that these digital codes themselves were protected by copyright? No, it's not that the codes were, were protected. And, and the codes themselves, I probably should have specified this, it was a, really a small alphanumeric code. It was maybe eight or ten, ten uh, characters. So that itself wouldn't have been subject to copyright. But the claim was is that the code itself was protecting a copyrighted work and was being provided in conjunction with the copyrighted work. So not so much that the code was protected, but just that it represented or it, it provided protection for the underlying work itself. Do you have, you know, some, I guess, with that in mind and kind of the facts of, you know, the difference between the, the denied and granted um, injunctions, you know, some takeaways for copyright holders to help tip the scales for protecting against this type of distribution? Um, so I would say that the, the difference between the, the denial of the first injunction and the granting of the second was that the, the limitations were much more conspicuous in the second scenario than they were the first. Uh, I think arguably a consumer could purchase the first set of goods and, and not have understanding uh, at all that they were going to be restricted in terms of whether they, uh, whether they would uh, be precluded from transferring that particular uh, physical good that they purchased. Um, so I think clear and conspicuous uh, disclosure of the material terms is really what, what ultimately made the difference between the denial and the granting here. Okay, that that's a good takeaway. If you're if you're a content provider, just make sure what you want to restrict is clear to the extent you know what that is in advance. I suppose. <laughs> I think that's right. Uh, so with that, I think I will turn it over to Chris to discuss uh, uh, some music developments. Yeah, from movies to music. Thanks, Mike. Uh, first case we're going to talk about is the Williams versus Gay case. Uh, the decision that we'll discuss is from the Ninth Circuit, uh, came down in March of 2018. Uh, why don't we start? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. There's, there's two songs at issue here. There's Marvin Gaye's Gotta Give It Up from 1977 and Will Ferrell, and Robin, or Ferrell Williams and Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines from 2013. I'm um, going to play a little clip here. from This first clip is... Marvin Gaye. And now here is Blurred Lines by Farrell Williams and Robin Thicke. So, so I, in listening to that, I think there, there's certainly similarities to the two songs, the, the, the way they're introduced and the, and the way they proceed. Um, but the court, the court actually struggled. The, the decision here was a, a split decision two to one in favor of upholding a jury verdict. Um, some background here that's important. Uh, Gotta Give It Up came out, uh, was written by Marvin Gaye and was released in 1977. Marvin Gaye didn't actually read or write music, so he would compose songs and record them. And then there was somebody that would actually transcribe sheet music to approximate or, or to capture the song. And then that sheet music was actually lodged with the copyright office um, as the musical composition. And because uh, the, the song came out in 1977, the Copyright Act of 1976 didn't apply because it didn't come out until, or it wasn't effective until January 1st of 1978. So this case was governed under the Copyright Act of 1909, which, which protected musical compositions, but not sound recordings. 
So the interesting thing here is what was at issue, the, the meets and bounds of Marvin Gaye's copyright for purposes of this suit were the four corners of the deposit copy of the sheet music uh, that was deposited with the uh, copyright office. Um, and in light of that, the district court excluded all sound recordings from the trial. So what you just heard uh, in, in the similarities you heard there were not presented at trial. What was presented at trial instead were expert witness musicians' interpretations of the sheet music that was lodged with the, with the copyright office. And for those of you who, who read music or, or have spent any time reading music, uh, you understand quickly that, that sheet music does not capture uh, the totality of a song. Sheet music needs to be interpreted, and that creates lots of problems. So, for instance, here there's, there's a bass line that is not written uh, in the sheet music per se, but you had one expert who said, well, that bass line, you know, I, I infer from the sheet music that that bass line would necessarily have had to follow this pattern. And you have an, uh, another expert that sits and says, well, no, 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 you can't infer that at all. Um, the sheet music doesn't say it, and I would interp interpret it a very different way. So what you ended up with at trial was a jury being presented recordings that were made by expert witnesses of their interpretations of a piece of sheet music uh, that was transcribed after a song was recorded 20-some-odd uh, years ago. In the end, uh, the jury, following a seven-day trial, uh, had a multi-million dollar verdict in favor of the Gay family uh, and included 50% go forward royalties uh, to the Gay family. The case was appealed on multiple uh, issues and it was sent to the Ninth Circuit. And as I said, it was, there was a two to one split in favor of upholding the verdict. Uh, the majority's opinion is very methodical and in essence, it, it holds that, yeah, let me, yeah it, it, it holds that uh, the copyright enjoys uh, uh, a broad protection, that, the cop that musical copyright is not um, confined to a narrow range of expression. And because of that, they cannot say that there was an absence of evidence supporting the jury's verdict. The jury heard two different experts and, and sided with one over the other. Well, Jacqueline Wynn, uh, in her dissent, uh, took great exception with this. And I'm going to read two statements from it because I think they're very telling of, of the analysis that she went through. She states, the majority allows the gays to accomplish what no one has before, copyright a musical style. Blurred lines and gotta give it up are not objectively similar. They differ in melody, harmony, and rhythm. Yet by refusing to compare the two works, the majority establishes a dangerous precedent that strikes a devastating blow to future musicians and composers everywhere. She then fall, she, she goes into a deep dive actually looking at musical score and she looks at past precedent. At one point she even shows that certain pitches and rhythms in a portion of Gotta Give It Up are identical to portions of Happy Birthday. And she closes with, the gays no doubt are pleased with this outcome. They shouldn't be. They own copyrights in many musical works, each of which, uh, including Gotta Give It Up, now potentially infringes the copyright of a famous song that preceded it. The majority responded to that in, in the, the final section of their opinion, and essentially what they say is our conclusion turns on the uh, precedential posture of the case that went all the way through trial. And so they have to take a very deferential standard of review and only look at what's in front of them. And they couldn't go into the deep dive that Judge Wynn wanted to. Um, so, so what you have here is, is an interesting outcome. It, it's a case that even the majority seems to be not fully convinced that the outcome was correct, but given the procedural posture of the case, uh, they felt that they were, they were tied to, to uphold the jury uh, and, and keep the case where it was. Um, two main factors were one that it proceeded through trial and two was that uh, neither side uh, moved for a judgment as a matter of law following trial. And in the majority's opinion, they said that bound their hands. Because, because there was no motion uh, for a judgment as a matter of law, there was nothing they could do procedurally to overturn this jury's verdict. Uh, the case finally came to an end, uh, I believe, in 
July of this year when a petition for rehearing in Bonk was finally denied. Okay, that takes us to uh, Gale versus HBO. It's another uh, another case uh, that came out last in 2018. Uh, in this case, Gale is a graffiti artist who lives in, in New York. Uh, he has a trademark in uh, It's Art We All, which is here on the left. Uh, he has a trademark in this, the phrase Art We All, and he has a copyright uh, in graffiti of that phrase. Gail, acting pro se, filed suit against HBO seeking $1.5 million for HBO's use of Art We All uh, in an episode of the show Vinyl. Uh, essentially, Gay's claim was that based on a brief showing of Gay's, his work uh, uh, graffitied onto a dumpster, um, that there was copyright infringement. So you can see here on the right of this slide, uh, is a is a screen capture. It's actually a picture of a TV that is showing the moment in time that the graffiti was shown in the episode of Vinyl. And as you can tell, it is very difficult to ascertain uh, what the what circled in red there says or is. And you see that it's in the background. It's not prominent. It's 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 not at the forefront of the scene. So in, in light of that, HBO filed a 12B6 motion to dismiss, and basically the thrust of their argument was that there's no substantial similarity between the work because the amount copied was de minimis. Um, the court concluded that, that they needed, it needed to assess the extent to which the copyrighted work was copied, um, and it, what was paramount uh, to the court was wh is the what how observable, observable is the, the work? Um, I think that the words they used were the observability of the work being paramount. Uh, in the end, the court stated that you know, Gail's claims are premised on a fleeting shot of barely visible graffiti painted on what appears to be a dumpster in the background of a single scene. The overall scene is brief and the graffiti at issue appears on screen for no more than two to three seconds. Moreover, the graffiti is never pictured by itself or in close-up, and it plays absolutely no role in the plot. It is next to impossible to notice when viewing the episode in real time. To counteract this, Gay presented a number of tweets, and it, it, it turns out the reason or the way Gay became aware of this allegedly infringing use of his graffiti was that a number of his fans uh, took these, these screen captures, these pictures of the television, and tweeted them to him, congratulating him uh, for getting his work placed on the TV show. Uh, but the court, in the end, dismissed the, the showing, stating that, you know, anonymous tweeters were not stand-ins for your average lay observer that is relevant in a, in a copyright uh, inquiry. Essentially, your la average lay observer would not have noticed or recognized the graffiti, whereas the super fans uh, who tweeted him these screenshots um, did. So in the end, the lesson is that a de minimis showing of a copyrighted work, uh, a fleeting in, in fleeting passing is not copyright infringement. Chris, is there um, kind of any takeaways in terms of, you know, content producers to make sure they're clearing all background art, um, you know, in terms, or does this not really move the, the needle that much? You know, I, I, I don't think it really moves the needle. It's, it, it's always advisable to, to, do your due diligence and, and clear your clear work that you include in the show. But the point here is you know, this scene was shot on a city street and there happened to be some graffiti in the background. Uh, the graffiti wasn't, you know, had they done a close up of it or had they, you know, prominently used that graffiti in some manner, then absolutely they should have, they should get clearance. But here it, it, it would be next to impossible to go frame by frame and make sure that there was, there was not graffiti or some artistic expression in the background of your show. And I think the court recognized that and, and you know, correctly found that, that that type of clearance would be over the top. Okay, great. Uh, with that, I think, I, Mike, is it back here? Is this, am I still on? Nope, I'm still on. 
All right. That, that takes us to the story of uh, Anastasia. So this case, uh, De Belvedere versus Anastasia, the musical LLC, is another substantial similarity case. Uh, this suit grew out of the story of Anastasia Romanoff, the daughter of Russian Tsar Nicholas II, who was long rumored to have survived the massacre of the Tsar's family in 1918. Uh, for many years following the massacre, there, there were many women who came forward claiming to be the long-lost Anastasia. And those stories, uh, the, the, those his, historical events led to uh, many stories being written, the first and maybe most famous of which was a play written in the 1940s um, that included a fictionalized version based upon the historical facts. That play was then translated into English in the 1950s and became the, the impetus for a movie of the same name that was also released. Um, then in, in May of 2016, um, a musical version of the, the Anastasia story was previewed in Hartford and then eventually in 2017 debuted on Broadway. Uh, following the initial preview run of the musical, uh, the rights holders to the play and the copyright holders uh, sued McNally, uh, the, the author of the Anastasia musical, uh, mu the Anastasia musical, uh, for copyright infringement, alleging that the musical copied many of the creative elements of the play by going beyond the historical record. Uh, the defendants filed a motion for summary judgment arguing that the play and the musical weren't substantially similar, and the motion was denied. So Chris, the court... Quick, sorry, Chris. We have a quick yeah. question from the audience sure. about um, fair use, uh, given that maybe this is not a complete work of fiction. <clears throat> uh, so it, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. This is for the, the background art. We're going back a case. Oh, okay. It jumped okay. on it a little bit late. <clears throat> And so what was the question? Is if the background of graffiti art could have been a fair use, um, had it been not a, you know, maybe if it, it just in terms of the use um, during the content. <clears throat> yeah, so that, that would have been an interesting, so, so you'd, you'd think about how much was copied, was 100% copied, was it transformative? Um, it, I, I don't think it was transformative. So I. I think a fair use argument, if you look at the four factors of fair use, would have been difficult here. Um, and it wasn't raised at all in the case. So, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I don't think that this would have risen to the level of fair use, just given, given that it was an exact copy um, on the show. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, that's okay. Sorry. That's, that's okay. Um, so the, the court in, in, in looking at the play, so this was interesting, the court actually invited the parties to, to, uh, to, to invite, oh, no, no, this, sorry, the, the court didn't invite early decision. They, they, um, sorry, my train of thought was thrown off. I got to refine my, my I, I threw a kink into you. I was sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it, it's good for me. Okay, so so a summary judgment was filed, and the court actually acknowledged that you know look there are, when there are copyrightable and non copyrightable material, uh, the ordinary observer test must be more discerning than than normal, and in such cases the court has to extract out the historical record and any non copyrightable historical uh, facts and only look at the, the copyrightable elements of the story and then compare those. Uh, in, the, in the court's words, here is the very clear and very cogent test that the court followed in order to do this comparison. Uh, it says, in reviewing defendant's motion for summary judgment, I'm required to review the play and the musical for substantial similarity in a more discerning manner, excluding elements not subject to copyright protection but paying attention to the similarities in such aspects as the total concept and feel, theme, characters, plot, sequence, pace, and setting of the disputed works. It is only where the points of dissimilarity exceed those that are similar 
and those that are similar are, when compared to the original work, of small import quantitatively and qualitatively that a finding of no infringement is appropriate. Um, as I read that test, I, I, think, I think what that test really means is that substantial similarity is an extremely close question of fact that makes summary judgment inappropriate. Uh, and in the end, that's actually what the court, court decided. Uh, the court relied on many elements of the play and the musical that, that aren't historical, and specifically uh, zeroed in on a fictional meeting between the Anna character and the grandmother in, that leads to a very emotional scene where the grandmother accepts Anna as her long-lost granddaughter and supports her to the family. And that's never seen in the in the historical record. So the similarity in that scene was enough for the court to say, look, I can't decide this on summary judgment. We need to go further. This case uh, may proceed to trial. Uh, there's currently a settlement conference set for October 18th of this year, and the discovery cutoff is January 16th of 2019. Uh, it, it appears to be heavily litigated and neither side seems to be interested in, uh, or at least nothing from the docket indicates that the parties are moving towards resolution. So stay tuned. Mike, I think, yeah, this now, now we're going to Mike. Great. Thanks, Chris. So if the blurred lines case that Chris was discussing a few moments ago is um, a good example of, appellate court deference to a jury verdict. I think Oracle v. Google, uh, the most recent decision from the Federal Circuit, is the exact opposite. So this is a case uh, involving Google's uh, copying of 37 what are called Java API packages uh, for use ultimately in the Android operating system. Um, Oracle sued Google for copyright infringement and patent infringement many moons ago. Uh, there was a trial, a first trial. Uh, I think it was back in 2000, 2010 or 11, as I recall. And a full trial on the issue of infringement, the jury found that there was no patent infringement. Um, and the jury finds copyright infringement, but they deadlocked on whether there was fair use associated with that infringement. Uh, the case was pending there in the Northern District of California. Judge Alsup was the presiding judge, and he was presented with a post-trial motion uh, by Google asking him to find that the copyrights in the APIs are invalid, that there actually is no copyright uh, in the API Java packages. And Judge Alsup put together what I still think today is a tour de force of a, an opinion. And he actually came to the conclusion, notwithstanding the jury verdict, that the copyrights, there, there is no valid copyright protection in these API packages. They're highly functional. Um, there's um, idea expression merger associated with them. And I thought put together a very compelling argument as to why there would be no copyright protection associated uh, with these API packages. That was ultimately appealed to the first, or excuse me, the Federal Circuit, the first, uh, the first appeal. Federal Circuit reverses and says, no, that's not entirely accurate. Judge Alsup, is, as a matter of fact, it's not accurate at all. These API packages are subject to copyright protection. Uh, so the case is, is remanded uh, for further consideration and ultimately remanded for the, the ultimate uh, decision as to whether there was fair use associated with Google's copying of these API packages. So there was a second trial, and the second trial was limited just to the issue of fair use. It was a whole week trial. There was many, many documents, multiple witnesses uh, that, were, that were called to testify. And at the end of the day, the jury rendered a verdict saying that there was fair use associated with uh, Google's use of the API packages. Uh, again, post-trial motions, uh, and Judge Alsup looked at it and ultimately upheld that verdict, uh, saying, look, reasonable minds uh, may differ, but there's certainly sufficient evidence to support this conclusion under the various uh, the four fair use factors that um, Google's use was fair. So this was appealed back to the Federal Circuit again. You may be asking, why is this going to the Federal Circuit uh, on a copyright case out of the, the Northern District of California. And that's because uh, statutorily, because there were patent claims initially uh, in the case, 
the appellate court is uh, the federal circuit as opposed to the Ninth Circuit. So in any event, this goes back up to the uh, federal circuit for a determination as to whether the jury got it wrong. And ultimately, and this is why I think this case is so, uh, so incredible, is the federal circuit essentially said you know, the issue of fair use is ultimately – whether the use at issue is ultimately fair is something we reviewed de novo and reviewed de novo. <laughs> they did. Um, they looked at all the evidence under the, the, the four factors and ultimately came to a different conclusion on, on the first uh, fair use factor. Um, they ultimately found that this really isn't that transformative. Uh, they, they ultimately said that the only one that was in Google's favor was the second factor. But ultimately, that's not all that important. Uh, Google uh, copied more than was necessary under the third fair use factor and ultimately said, look, no reasonable jury could have concluded that there was no market harm. Uh, there was evidence presented that Java was included in early cell phones, early BlackBerry and, and, and Nokia um, models. So ultimately, this was not fair use as a matter of law. Now, Google uh, petitioned for uh, rehearing on Bonk. That was just uh, recently denied within the last few weeks. And uh, Google has, has vowed to take this all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. So this, uh, stay tuned. We have not seen the end of this one. It will be very interesting to see if uh, the United States Supreme Court takes this one up. So let's stick with the uh, Google train of thought here. I, I want to harken back to a decision uh, a few years ago issued by the Second Circuit dealing with the Google Books project. Recall that this was a case involving the digitization of 20 million books from universities and libraries uh, by Google. And what Google wanted to do was essentially take all of this vast knowledge that's contained within these universities, digitize it, and make it available for people to, for, for research purposes, essentially. Uh, Recall that this case went up to the Second Circuit. Uh, Judge Laval, writing for the court, found that Google's book project was uh, fair use, found that it, the, it was uh, uh, highly transformative, and ultimately what the court said is there was no market harm associated with the digitization here because only small snippets of the books would ultimately be available for a given researcher and ultimately found that you know, this, the small snippets that would be available from the, from the books themselves would uh, not, uh, not cause harm to the market. Okay, so that's, that's Google Books, and the reason it's relevant is we have a, a dispute here involving a company called TBIs that wanted to take advantage of the Second Circuit holding in the Google Books case. So TBIs is a company that records uh, uh, TV stations. I think it recorded something like 14 or 1,500 TV stations and records the content that's published through those TV stations or aired through those TV stations 24-7. Uh, it created, as you can imagine, a massive database uh, of all these recordings that would be available uh, for a, uh, a subscription. So if you, were, if you were paying $500 or willing to pay $500 a month, you could access this, uh, this database and you could stream, download, share, do all sorts of things with this content. Now the catch was you could only, you could only have access to 10 minute clips. So TVIs was trying to, to situate itself saying, look, we're, we're essentially Google Books um, of, of TV. You know, we're, we're copying all this TV content, we're making it available uh, under a subscription model but we're making it available uh, on a very limited basis for only 10 minutes. Of course, um, what you could do actually under the TVI's um, subscription plan is, is you, could, you could gobble up as many of these 10-minute segments as you wanted. So even though you, it was limited, uh, there was nothing that would preclude a, a subscriber from actually uh, streaming all of the content or downloading uh, all of it in these 10-minute segments. So uh, the trial court actually uh, dismissed several of Fox's claims and found that um, the watch function, meaning essentially the streaming function associated with TVIs, was fair use. Uh, 
So Fox appeals that up to the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit reverses and says, no, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not correct. Uh, a couple of the factors in particular that the court found that were particularly problematic would be the, the third factor. You know, it did say under the first factor, you know, whether it's transformative. It said, yes, I mean, it's, it's mildly transformative. You know, you're making it available for researchers and historians and other people that would like to see this content. So it's, it's mildly uh, transformative. But really, the, the problematic aspects uh, were both the third and the fourth factor, saying, look, the, you're, you're making all of this available, all this content, copying it en masse. Uh, and so you're, you're copying um, more than, than what might be uh, considered necessary, radically dissimilar uh, to what's happening in the, in the Google Books case. Mike, do you think the that, fact, yep. that they had done, you know, a limited snippet, you know, one 10-minute segment versus unlimited ones may have tilted the scale? <laughs> um, I, d I don't know that it would have, Gina, because ultimately on the, on the fourth factor, you know, the court seemed uh, pretty set that, look, what you're doing is ultimately affecting uh, the market value for Fox to offer similar types of, of subscription models itself. So you're depriving Fox of licensing revenues. Whereas in the, in the Google Books case, uh, Judge Laval found that there really isn't any evidence of, of market-based harm here. So I think that I, I think it's, it is qualitatively different than what we saw in in, um, in Google Books, um, but again, this one, uh, this one too, uh, may not be may not be over. There is a petition uh, for writ of certiorari uh, that was filed by uh, by TVI. So uh, we'll see uh, see what happens. I think it was just filed within the last uh, few weeks. So so stay tuned on that. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I wanted. Uh, I know we're we're uh, we still got a few, you know, number of cases we wanted to get through. I wanted to fast forward to a, a fun case here, uh, dealing with with copyright and uh, uh, fair use again, uh, involving uh, oh the places you'll go. This uh, uh, everybody is familiar with the Dr. Seuss oh the places you'll go book, uh, comic mix. Uh, decided to publish a mashup. Uh, you, you see at the top of your screen, oh, you, oh the places you'll go is the, is the original work. Uh, down below is the, the cover from the allegedly infringing work, work called Oh, the Places You'll Boldly Go. Uh, Comic Mix decided to put together a mashup of Star Trek and Dr. Seuss. And the work itself, as you can see through some of these slides, um, you know, uh, copies to a large extent the look and feel of the underlying work quite a bit. Um, the, the defendant moved to dismiss the complaint, uh, moved to dismiss saying, hey, what we're doing is fair use as a matter of law. You know? uh, so on a 12B6, they actually moved to dismiss the, the complaint. Rather bold a move, if I, I'm, I might uh, say so myself. Um, but interestingly enough, what the, what the trial court said is, look, this is highly transformative. Uh, this mashup where you're combining two disparate uh, concepts, two different worlds colliding, and you're doing it in a, in a uh, funny, uh, comical way, that's highly transformative. Um, you know, it, it ultimately said, you're, you defend it, you're only, it appears like you're only taking as much as you need to in order to do this mashup. Uh, and and ultimately the court gets down to the fourth fair use factor and says, uh, but I can't tell based on the record here if there's any harm to the market. Plaintiff says there is, so I'm going to presume there is at this point. But Comic Mix must have been feeling pretty good about this initial, uh, about this initial uh, salvo here and the court's ultimately, ultimate decision on the, on the first complaint. Um, you know, it, it is essentially winning on three of the, three of the four fair use factors. Well, uh, so that Dr. Seuss Enterprise was not uh, going to be, uh, uh, not going to let that one sit. So what they did is they filed an amended complaint and they made it clear that with respect to the fourth fair use factor that, that they actually license out uh, works 
uh, based on, oh, the places you'll go. Not only do they have a series of books that's a, a takeoff on it, but they actually have, have licensed third parties to create content based on, oh, the places you'll go. So what happened then is that uh, the defendant moved to dismiss again under fair use, saying, look, this is, this is fair use as a matter of law, I think trying to put the best spin on it that they could. Uh, but the court ultimately said, actually, there, there is no fair use now uh, because there would be harm as alleged here uh, in, the, in the First Amendment complaint. So it was a, a, a short-lived victory, I think, for the folks at Comic Mix. I believe the case is still uh, ongoing at this point. Chris, do you want to uh, talk about the other, the other uh, Dr. Seuss Who's Holiday case? Yeah, sorry, I was talking and I was on mute. So yeah, there's, there's, uh, let's let's contrast this because I think they're uh, they're quite different. Um, Pooh's Holiday is a one actress play featuring a down and out version of Cindy Lou Who, who we first met as an adorable little two year old in Dr. Seuss's uh, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. Uh, in Who's Holiday, Cindy Lou, uh, she. It, she speaks to the audience in, in rhyming couplets that evoke the works of Dr. Seuss. And the, the whole premise of the play is Cindy Lou is sitting on stage, talking to the audience, waiting for a number of party guests to arrive. And while waiting for her party guests to arrive, uh, while sipping a martini, Cindy Lou tells the audience the story of her life, beginning with her first encounter with the Grinch at age two, and moving through her marriage to the Grinch, the birth of her daughter, the death of Grinch, her time in jail, all the way to the present. Uh, the story is very crude and vulgar, uh, uses a lot of uh, adult language, uh, imagery, innuendo, uh, and has vast descriptions of alcohol and drug abuse and bestiality. So the court, this is the case, that both, both of these cases, the last case I spoke to is Judge Hellerstein in the Southern District of New York, as was this one. Uh, and in this case, Judge Hellerstein actually invited uh, the, the defendant here to file a 12C motion uh, and ended up dismissing the complaint by finding fair use. Uh, looking at the factors, the first, the first factor uh, of fair use, the court found that the play was indeed a parody. Uh, defined as a literary or artistic work that imitates the characteristic style of an author or work for comic effect or ridicule. The court stated, uh, and I think it's worth actually quoting him here, that the play recontextualizes Grinch's easily recognizable plot and rhyming style by placing Cindy Lou Who, a symbol of childhood innocence and naivete, in outlandish, profanity-laden, adult-themed scenarios involving topics such as poverty, teen pregnancy, drug and alcohol abuse, prison culture, and murder. In so doing, the play subverts the expectations of the Seussian genre and lampoons Grinch by making Cindy Lou's naivete, Whoville's endlessly smiling, problem-free citizens, and Dr. Seuss's rhyming innocence all appear ridiculous. Um, so as a parody, and, and having done quite the uh, extensive uh, dive into what it means to be a parody, uh, the court found Whose Holiday to be transformative. Uh, the court, on the second factor, the nature of the copyrighted work, uh, the court said it was not heavily weighted in parody cases and dismissed it fairly out of hand. And the third factor, the amount and substanti uh, substantiality of use, the court stated that parodies are entitled to more extensive use of the original work, and here, uh, whose holiday, uh, the, the copying was reasonable in proportion. And finally, and I think this is, is you know, marked difference from the, the case that Mike just discussed, the effect on the potential market for the copyrighted work, the court found that this factor strongly weighed in favor of whose holiday, uh, as the two works serve completely different market functions. Uh, you know, specifically, the court the court stated that defendant makes no allegation that it intends to authorize a parody containing references to bestiality, drug use, and other distinctly unsuician topics. And uh, the Dr. Seuss estate, Dr. Seuss Enterprises, had no counter to, to that. So, 
So that brings us, the next case we have on here, it brings us to the hotbed, the well-known fertile ground of copyright decisions, uh, Idaho. And specifically, uh, the case of uh, James Castle Collection and Archive versus Scholastic. Um, James Castle was a person born in 1899 in rural Idaho. Uh, he was born deaf and he never actually learned to communicate orally or in writing. But, uh, you know, despite his, his limitations and his, his difficulties, he actually ended up becoming a prolific artist uh, using various resources that he found in and around the home and elsewhere. Essentially, he made art out of trash. Uh, his works have actually become uh, very well known and have been shown throughout the world, including in the Smithsonian American Art Museum and other museums on a regular basis. Uh, his works are all owned and maintained by the James Castle uh, Collection and Archive. A, a couple years ago, an author and illustrator named Alan Say uh, wrote a children's book entitled Silent Days, Silent Dreams. Uh, the story was written from the perspective of, of a fictional nephew of Castle's. Uh, and, and the book contains over a hundred uh, 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 drawings that are that were created by Say that were intended to mimic Castle's uh, unschooled artistic style. Uh, and, and what's interesting is 28 of the of the works in the book are actual copies of Castle's original work. So although there are a hundred a hundred artistic works that show this, that are used to show the style, there are 28 that are, are pretty clearly uh, copies of actual work. And those are actually shown here in the slide. So and the James, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Chris, we're just running short of time. So I'm wondering if we can jump and then we'll, we'll leave the rest yep. of the cases, I think, just for the handouts. <clears throat> yes, I will, I will short circuit this. So in the end, the court actually did what I think is a, a, a fairly curious analysis and found that, that this work was fair use. Um, they said it was transformative to imagine a, a fictionalized biography, but, ima but think about what that does you know, as precedent. So are we going to see Picasso or Warhol imagined biographies that, that contain direct copies of their works? Um, and then looking at the fourth factor, harm, uh, the court said that plaintiff dislikes the way Castle's portrayed in the book and uh, would not have licensed his art for that use. Well, that's actually, uh, that's the analysis for factor four that's typically done by uh, when, when looking at a parody. So in the end, this, this, this case actually felt very pragmatic because the books had already been released to publishers and getting them back would have been difficult. Uh, so I'm not sure if this case will have any precedential value going forward, but it was very interesting to see uh, how it was handled by the court. And it's settled in June of this year, so, so there won't be an appeal. Okay, great. And um, feel free to reach out to um, either, you know, Mike, Chris, or myself if you have any, any questions or any follow-up. Um, a copy of the slides will be sent along with a link for a survey of uh, how the presentation went. And please let us know if you have any ideas that, you know, concepts you would like to see another webinar on. Uh, we do these quarterly. And then um, a couple of pings. I'll let Mike be the spokesperson here for Dorsey's IP litigation practice um, and our TMCA blog. Oh, thanks, Gina, and, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we just wanted to mention a little bit about our practice. Uh, you know, we have a very robust IP litigation practice that covers all types of IP litigation practice from copyright, trademark, patent, to, to false advertising, uh, and, and everything in between. So um, we're, we're thrilled to uh, have been here uh, with you uh, today. The one last thing that I'll also mention is we uh, – we do have our TMCA blog uh, that uh, we were recently uh, uh, happily um, awarded this uh, award by the ABA Journal 
we were uh, listed as one of the top 50 uh, law blocks. So we're really thrilled and, and honored to receive that, uh, that distinction. Please feel free to sign up at the blog if you'd like more information on any of these uh, cutting edge issues that we've been talking about today and other ones that are, are sure to be uh, in the offing soon. So thank you very much for being with us. Yep. Thank you, everyone.